day during your lunchtime. Um, I think we'll give it another minute. I see some people still coming in the waiting room, but we're glad to have you here. I think we'll, we'll get started actually, since we only have an hour here together today um, for this Insights for Inclusive Excellence, the conversation with the CTRL student partners. So I'm actually in CTRL office in Hearst right now and the student partners are here with me. Um, I'm going to really go back to a, a neutral background and just let them wave hi. We're all here together. So um, doing a little bit of a hybrid session, you all are online, but we wanted to be here in the room together to support each other and, and to celebrate all of their accomplishments. So um, you will, I'll be starting off the session, then I'm gonna pass it off to Reba Matthews, who is one of our lead student partner, and she'll talk a little bit about the program and then she'll introduce each of the speakers. So they'll talk through their projects. So that will be Gabriela Rupp, Kutsia Saeed, C.L. Smith and Marie Mineda. Um, so welcome. And as we're you know, getting settled and um, people are still joining from the waiting room, just like to hear in the chat, um, what brought you to the session and what do you hope to gain from hearing student perspectives? Maybe especially at this point in the semester, we're getting into finals because there will be time later in the session and throughout the session for you to ask the students questions directly and hear their thoughts. And so Marley, Marley Crutcher is interested in any insights that would help to inform academic advising practices. So it seems like we have people here, and not just faculty, but also staff from different offices across campus. Another idea coming in the chat, hoping to gain insight and ideas for the next semester. So we're already thinking about what's to come in the fall. And then Erica is in IT, doesn't get much interaction with students anymore, but is very interested in our campus community, interested in learning more about student perspectives. Terry, thank you. Interested in hearing student perspectives directly, focused on DEI inclusive excellence training recently, but would help to hear about what is happening on our own campus. Excellent. So thank you for sharing those thoughts and feel free to continue add ideas to the chat as we go. So now I'm going to pass uh, the mic to Reba, who will talk through our session guidelines, learning outcomes, and an overview of who the students are and what we aim to do on campus here. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so I've been offered the opportunity by our supervisor, Hannah, to lead the session today, which I'm very grateful for. And so just to go over some of the session guidelines, um, after each presenter, each presenter will be presenting on their semester project. Um, and so after that, there'll be time for discussion, as well as if you would like to ask them any questions. They're really excited about all their projects, and they would love, love, love to have questions from you all. Um, so just some guidelines for that. We all agree to be respectful, um, meaning we honor each other's differences. Um, we're open-minded, so we invite rather than dismiss different perspectives. All of our student partners are so open-minded this morning, feeling extra open-minded. Um, we're very engaged, so that means we're actively participating. I really appreciate everyone who shared in the chat earlier today, um, earlier in the session. And we're also growth-oriented. 
Uh, so we seek to learn new ideas, not just confirm. And we're going to learn a lot today from all of our projects and presenters. And we're also going to be active listeners. So we're going to listen to understand and not to respond. Okay. And just to talk a little bit more about what you can get out of today's session, um, hopefully by the end of this day's session, you'll uh, be able to identify various challenges and barriers to equity present at AU. Um, many of our projects are gonna speak on that specifically. Um, maybe you'll be able to apply specific student recommended strategies to improve your teaching, or you'll be able to reflect on student perceptions of how to create more inclusive and effective teaching and learning environments at AU. Um, please do not pressure yourself to complete all of this. We appreciate any effort at all. And we, once again, appreciate so much you all being here today. And yeah, so just a little bit of insight into our program. Um, so every week of this semester, uh, we all, uh, the student partners, would meet weekly uh, for meetings. And Hannah would guide us through uh, a certain topic. Uh, so that could have been about accessibility in the classroom, midterms, we discussed SET reviews, which I know is something that's coming up for y'all. Um, and we just gave our student perspective and also shared about a lot about our experiences. A lot of student partners will infamously say it's kind of like a rant session in the best way. Um, it really is an opportunity to allow students to candidly share their experiences and then invest that into back into their own individual projects, which is something that all of our student partners have been working very, very hard and diligently on all semester. And these projects are actually based on their own individual interests and passions and what they saw needed help on campus. And uh, you know that's gonna be addressed today. So I'm very, very excited to hear from our student partners as I sure you all are as well. <laughs> So some of our goals uh, from the program, I've been with CTRL for I think about a year now, and I can assure you that all these goals are definitely true uh, to saying, and some of our goals were uh, gaining professional skills and leadership experience, which are something I hope I'm adequately displaying this morning. You can let me know in the chat. Um, we also uh, engaged in things to help increase self-efficacy, -effic -eff um, confidence, and employability. We develop awareness as a learner, as we discussed about our experiences in the classroom, um, but also develop our unique voice as uh, students, and um, that's something that's really fostered here at CTRL. And because of that, we're able to generate unique contributions that will benefit the wider AU community. These projects are all listed on CTRL's website. Feel free to check them out. They're awesome from past semesters as well. And then hopefully from this program, instructors, staff, and administration will be able to critically reflect on the diversity and perspectives and personal experiences among students at AU. This is so awesome. This program is completely centered around student voice and um, we appreciate y'all coming over here to listen. Uh, we also are attempting to reconceptualize learning and teaching as a collaborative process between students and faculty. Uh, so that means trusting student insights, knowing that they're valued and hopefully they are applied in some way. Um, and we would also like to demonstrate transformed thinking about teaching by applying these same student viewpoints and perspectives. I think we can go. Yeah, so we'll have our first student partner, and she's going to introduce herself. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Marie Dianetta, and I am graduating next week. That means I'm a senior. Um, so, sorry, for background, I'm a fifth-year student here at AU, meaning that I am a super senior. And this is my second semester with CTRL, and I'm a literature major with a concentration in creative writing. Um, for now, for my project with CTRL, I kind of wanted to do a final reflection on my thoughts as a college, as an upcoming college graduate. Of course, there's like no such thing as like finality in beliefs, ideas, thoughts, because ideas are constantly changing. Um, hence the quotations. However, my intention with this creative essay is to capture my thoughts on schooling, specifically in higher education, when the emotions are still fresh in my mind. Um, I understand that this is a bit of an unconventional resource for those who want to further their 
understanding of pedagogy in higher education. But truthfully, in this essay, I try to refrain from making suggestions for teaching. I try to kind of rooted it in my own experiences as well. Um, throughout the essay, I've inserted real notes I've written to myself throughout college. I've inserted real questions, the like questionnaires that I've taken throughout college as well. Um, but if you're interested in pedagogy, education, and stuff like that, um, I hope that my essay can give you a different look on a student's perspective, especially as someone who is graduating soon. Um, writing and sharing stories is how people give consent to the world. And I just kind of wanted to give my perspective as somebody who has been at AU for many years. And as I stated in my presentation, the lessons I remember the most are hardly the ones I've ever learned in the classroom. Um, so now we're going to begin our Q&A session with Marie. Uh, so just to first start our question is, what is the purpose of student perspective in teaching and learning? I kind of mentioned it at the end of my slide, but the purpose of student perspective, the purpose of writing is to kind of give consent to the world. Um, a lot of the times there's like that idea that teachers are supposed to be teaching and students are only supposed to be learning, but in reality, someone knows, everyone knows something that you don't, or everyone knows something that you might not know already. So we can like learn together and encourage student perspectives in the classroom because everyone has a different idea and a different belief and has embodied different embodied the human experience in different ways. Um, so Marie's a literature major, if you can't tell by her amazing writing and voice. Uh, so she always creates such an amazing project, and I really enjoyed this semester's project. So feel free to ask her any more questions. Drop them in the chat. You can raise your hand and say them out loud. Um, but she's very open to questions. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some time to look over her resource as well. Um, so, oh, I think we have some questions in the chat. <laughs> okay, so, Marie, somebody asked, what is a super senior? How is it being a fifth year senior different from the BAMA combined program? That is a great question. A super senior is someone who was intended to graduate with four years, but due to personal reasons, past failures, et cetera, in the academic sense, they had to retake or take an extra year um, if you were to look at, my, um, I kind of wrote about it in my last project with CTRL, how I almost failed out of AU or technically did fail out of AU. And then I returned, um, hence the extra year as a super senior. Then I think we have another question here. If you were a freshman again, knowing all that you know now, what would you do differently? Would you do anything differently? It's very hard to say, mostly because I feel like I obviously know a lot more now than I did before. And I don't think that I would have learned as much if I didn't go through as many hardships as I did in undergraduate in my undergraduate career. However, whenever I think back on it, I think of about all the lessons I've learned and not to sound like too gauche or anything like that. I think of all the lessons I've learned and how much money it cost me. Um, to learn those lessons, learning lessons at the end of the day, I learned is also a privilege um, to do that, to like fail out of school and then be able to come back. So I don't know necessarily if I would want to change anything about my undergraduate career or my freshman year career. However, I do wish that perhaps it didn't just cost as much money to learn life lessons like that. A very valid critique of higher education. Thank yeah. you, Marie. And I see that Max hand is raised. So if you'd like to ask your question and unmute. Sure. Yeah. Um, so love this. You all are awesome. Um, and I was just, and I don't know if you'll have a um an answer for this, which is totally understandable. 
But um, Marie, in your project, which I haven't read fully, so I'll fully admit that right now, but I scanned over it and um, you are super reflective, right? And that's that's such a helpful skill for students to learn so that they can think about what they're learning and how to apply it in different contexts and, you know, really kind of process that information. Um, so I was wondering if you had any suggestions for how instructors can help um, students kind of develop some of that reflective practice. Thanks. Yeah, for, thank you for the question. Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, it's a very difficult question to answer because I'm naturally reflective as an individual. I think that's one of the reasons why I chose to be a literature major with creative writing because I really love stories and I love reflecting on my life and like just sharing those stories in that matter. Um, I think though, if I had to remember like my favorite classrooms where I was really reflective is when instructors pulled in student perspective, like the actual student class perspective, the class's mind and stuff into like the lesson lesson plans. Like they helped relate what they're learning back to the back to the students and taught students why that this is relevant to them. And then that caused students to be a little bit more reflective in their in their schooling, I suppose. That's a really good answer. Ooh. Oh, actually we have another hand raised. You can go ahead and unmute. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yes, Marie, I love, I, I, I really appreciate um, you leaning in and being vulnerable. And I'm just wondering too, um, thank you for sharing your story. So I'm wondering, um, and I know there are many different parts, but are there ways that as we think about, like I know parents are also a critical, you know, support structure for many students. So based on from your insights, what insights do you have in terms of, you know, based on your experience to how parents, you know, may be able to, you know, better to, to better support, you know, their students, you know, in college, recognizing that college students have many wins and and many opportunities, but there are also some challenges and tensions. So would appreciate your insight there. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, sure. my, par my parents are very influential in my return back to college. Um, I think it's because they went into it with a lot of empathy. I was already stressing about money. I was already stressing about grades a lot of the time when students aren't doing well in college and there's a lot of tensions, they're already the hardest critic of themselves. And I think my parents understood that. And they were like, you need someone to be kind to you right now. And it is our job to teach you how to be kind to yourself because you don't know how to do it yet, um, especially at the face of failure. Um, so I think going into anything, especially with challenges, the first instinct should be empathy because I don't think solutions necessarily sometimes are the most, the most like the, the best answer. Sometimes you just need someone to tell you that it does suck and then telling them that you can be, it's okay to step down. Because I remember I didn't want to drop out of school. I wanted to like continue going through academic probation, but my parents were like, absolutely not. You need to come out. At the end of the day, we want, we want a daughter that's happy. And if she's not good at school, that's okay. I want a happy daughter, not a sad daughter who's successful in school. Thank you. Thank you. That was really sentimental. <laughs> um, I love my parents. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Oh. Okay, well, we can move on. <laughs> thank you so much, Marie, for sharing your presentation. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're now going to transition to our next student partner. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> okay. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is CL and I'm a junior at AU right now um, and I'm an SIS major, just for context. Um, so for my project, I decided to make a podcast documenting the experiences of first-gen low-income and rural students on campus. Um, and this project was definitely inspired um, by my own experiences as a rural student on campus. Um, you know, I grew up in Appalachia, um, whole country. Um, so when I came to AU, it was definitely a very new and different environment, not only because it's very, very urban compared to what I'm used to, um, but also because this, it's a very different group of people than I've ever really been around in my life. Um, 
And then in addition to that, you know, going to a high school in a rural area that is very underfunded, under-resourced, you know, doesn't offer any kind of higher level coursework, really like there was two AP classes we had at the time, I'm pretty sure now they only have one. Um, no IB classes, no college prep, SAT prep. The only people that came to the school really to talk about um, post-grad opportunities were um, the military and the local trade schools. So, you know, obviously coming to AU was definitely very jarring. Um, so I really wanted to create a resource to talk about those experiences. Um, and initially I was just going to vo um, focus on rural students. Um, but then as I started interviewing people and hearing their experiences, I realized that the experiences of rural students, first gen um, and low income students are not only similar in a lot of ways, but also often intertwined um, because most everyone I talked to, they were going through, I mean, had all of these experiences and all of these identities um, like that they consider to be a part of them. Um, so yeah, I really just wanted to shed light on some of the challenges that these students face mainly, um, just because I feel like it's not really discussed a lot here. And then also a lot of instructors in my experience are not really familiar with these experiences. Um, so the goal of this podcast is to also just like allow professors to hear directly from students um, instead of hearing you know, just research or a summary, like a summary of these experiences, I thought it would be a lot more valuable to actually hear straight from students themselves. Um, so in this podcast, first, I talk about a lot of the challenges um, that students face, um, including what it's like to transition to AU, um, how the a lack of having a really thorough high school education um, impacts your experience at AU. And then I used, I compiled a lot of um, the things that people told me when I was interviewing them to create a list of things that professors can do to help these students, because obviously there's parts to these struggles that they're just going to be hard. Um, it's going to be harder for these people than it is for some other students on campus who come from more privileged backgrounds. Um, but there are still some steps professors can take, uh, such as just acknowledging students' experiences, experiences in class, being aware that these might be issues students are dealing with, even though the majority of AU students are not dealing with them. Um, and also just developing relationships with students um, in order to like see these issues come out and be able to address them. Um, and in the podcast, I talked about four different things total that professors can do. Um, and then finally, um, also using the interviews and the stories I heard from people, I compiled a list of like particularly harmful behaviors that instructors engage in. Um, I'd say the most prominent one was probably uh, making assumptions about student knowledge that seemed to be very common. And I can vouch for that. That was honestly, I think the most harmful thing to me in general. So yeah, I just hope this podcast can, I mean, obviously like raise awareness about these things, but also I hope people can take away some like concrete changes they can make in the classroom um, in order to better include these students and not make them feel so alienated from the community. Thank you so much, CL, for that project. Um, I would definitely, if you can make the time, go and listen to that podcast. I think we can move to our question portion. Um, so any questions, same deal. You can drop them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I think I will start us off because I'm very curious. Um, I want to know more about your process with, you know, just formatting your questions and then, you know, it's coming from an experience where you can relate to the people you were interviewing. Like, how was this process for you? What do you think you got out of making this podcast? Yeah, I'd say definitely, um, like, even in terms of, like, things that I learned, like, I am from a rural area, so that's something that is, you know, like, a background that's impacted me. But at the same time, I am privileged enough to have two parents who attended college, um, and I've been middle class throughout my entire life. Um and I definitely like, you know, I grew up in Appalachia, so I grew up around a lot of poverty, um, but it was definitely, I'm not sure that I had fully conceptualized how those experiences all come together, like in college. So it was definitely, I, it was really insightful to hear from people who had been through all these three experiences at once. Um, and it definitely changed my perspective on a, a lot of things. Um, and then I guess in terms of the questions, I came up with 
a list of questions I wanted to ask people. But then when I ended up talking to them, it kind of just became more of like a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really what turned the direction of this project. You know, initially I was really focusing on like some of the rural aspects, but then just hearing what people said, like the, I just, it just became very clear to me that these identities are just inseparable in a lot of ways. And like the intersectionality between everything has to be acknowledged. So yeah, that ended up really being what shaped my project. Yeah, and I think in that answer, you kind of answered uh, some of the questions in the chat. Shed asked, are there any directions that the conversations went that you didn't expect? or surprising trends in the conversation. And then we have a question asking if you can share more about types of assumptions faculty would make about students uh, when you said that it was one of the most harmful faculty behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So in when I'm talking about assumptions, the main thing I'm talking about is assuming previous knowledge that students may or may not be coming in with um, just because and I'm sure this is a lot because a lot of students at AU, you know, I talked about my podcast that um, over 70% of AU's body is actually from the top 20% of income earners in America. So a lot of these students are coming in, having gone to prep schools, private high schools that really do provide a thorough education um, versus, you know, going to a school that, like I said, like we didn't really have AP classes. We had AP chemistry. Um, but, you know, for someone like me who's coming into SIS, like that's not necessarily a helpful advanced background to have. So um, and I talk about this in the podcast as well. Um, my first year, people, um, a lot of professors described assignments as model UN-esque. And that was kind of the only description we would get other than the fact that we were preparing some kind of debate. And, you know, for me, like my school didn't even have a debate team, much less any kind of association with Model UN. So for me, that was not helpful at all. But at the same time, I could see how, you know, everyone else around me seemed to immediately understand what was going on. And they seemed like, you know, excited, like, oh, this is something I know how to do. This is something I know how to understand, like, I know how to understand. Um, but I didn't. And it can be really hard to speak up and ask questions about things like that when it's pretty clear that you may be the only person in the class that's having those same questions. Um, and yeah, just assumptions like just I think history too. like I had a high school that was still telling me that the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery. Um, and that was just preached in every single class. So the knowledge I came in with about history was very limited, <laughs> to say the least. And I think it was just, it was really hard when professors assumed that, like, I already, yeah, I already knew all these things, especially about, I mean, international history was a whole nother thing. Like, if we didn't even know U.S. history, like, it just, yeah, things like that. And assuming that students are coming in with that instead of, you know, making an effort to discuss these things in class or at least asking if people are aware of these things. Um, yeah, it can just make you feel very isolated for sure. Um, I think we'll just ask the last question really quickly. Uh, for those who haven't listened to the podcast yet, maybe what is one or two things that you want to share, like highlights from it? Hmm. Highlights. I'd say I think the discussion about what it's like to transition to AU coming from these backgrounds was really interesting Um, just because, you know, first impressions are kind of everything. So if you come to AU and, you know, your first year impressions are just that you feel extremely alienated, then that kind of colors the rest of your experience here um, and becomes something you really have to like work to, you know, you have to work to succeed like in the face of those things. Um, so I'd say definitely like a major takeaway is that professors who teach first year classes, um, really need to be especially aware of these things, I think, and really make an effort to distribute resources, um, especially because like there are, the resources for these students on campus are limited, um, very limited, but there are some first gen resources. Um, and I think, yeah, distributing those and making it clear that professors are open for questions is like definitely a good step in the right direction. Thank you so much, CL, for sharing about your project and being so open with questions. We will now be moving on to our next student partner. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Gabriella. Um, so I am a sophomore at AU and I'm studying education and gender studies as well as poli sci. And um, 
that's kind of where my project is rooted in and my interest is rooted in is that intersection of the education field and the gender studies field and how we can leverage that intersection to best support students and make equitable spaces in academics. So that's kind of why I'm here. Um, and then just kind of going over the basic outline of the project, I chose, I did a lot of research in the first half of the semester and then I chose a rather daunting task of then condensing that into a very brief visual resource because I really wanted it to um, have like a strong read readability aspect to it. Um, so you will find it is very brief, um, but I try to touch on all the important points and then I strongly encourage you to go through that further reading section um, and learn some more about it. So I had a brief overview of what I talk about. Um, so my project is demarginalizing feminine speech in the classroom. So it highlights the ways that traditionally feminine speech, um, which again, there's an anecdote about um, avoiding binary language there, but for the sake of this project, that's, um, it's, it's uh, including female identifying individuals experiences due to socialization. So the f feminine speech patterns that I look at are verbal hedges and disclaimers, um, verbal fillers, vocal fry and, and verbal uplifts. And you can read more in the project about what those specific things include. Um, and I found in my research that a lot of these linguists don't necessarily agree on the origins of these patterns, but they do agree that they develop for a purpose, um, a practical purpose, whether socially or professionally. And the problem arises that many of these speech patterns are considered unacademic, unintelligent, or unprofessional. Um, I repeat those three words a lot in the project because they're really important. And that kind of creates this like masculine linguistic dominance in the classroom and in academic spaces. And with a lot of neg negative results for female identifying students. So there's the internal res results, which is things like imposter syndrome, um, limiting yourself from going out for positions or for um, opportunities because you may feel unqualified as a result of that. Um, and kind of that internal pressure to alter your natural speech pattern to kind of conform in this specifically like masculine dominant environment. And then um, Later on, that follows you into your career. Um, and I talk specifically about in academia, how female students are very overrepresented. Um, at AU, we almost have a two thirds majority um, of female to male students. And that's for various other reasons that would be a whole other project. But when you look at people pursuing careers in academia, it's the exact opposite. It's a very strong male majority for really no explainable reason. And I personally believe that this is one of the factors contributing to that. Um, so then I talk about action steps for instructors to kind of deconstruct this in their classroom and reduce the impacts of this like systemic issue. Um, and I point to using diverse input and output for learning. So including diverse resources um, and like readings and things like that, pulling from diverse authors into your classroom and then allowing students to also demonstrate their learning in a way that's more comfortable for them, which may for many students mean breaking outside of that traditional academic paper format. Um, going beyond that, during class discussion, avoiding over-regulation, and that same thing goes for grading, um, make, being intentional about focusing on what students are saying and not how they're saying it is a really big component of this. And then finally, and this goes for beyond instructors, but anyone in an academic space is encouraging students, specifically female students, to build those self-advocacy skills and call out harm where it exists. And that can't come out of the void. That also has to exist in a like accountability mindset um, on the other side of the table. So yeah, that's basically the gist of my project. I also included some student voices and student quotes that I strongly encourage you to read over because I found that to be very impactful from my fellow AU students about their experiences with this kind of marginalization. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, so I think we're going to move on to our QA portion now. Um, so same deal in the chat or if you want to unmute. She loves questions. She answers them so well. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question. Okay. As a you know, female identifying identifying student yourself, what is something that through this project you observe, like how you come and show up in the classroom? You know, through this project, how do you feel you're now able to advocate for yourself or maybe your peers to your professors? I love that question. Um, we talk a lot in CTRL, or I do at least, about like the differences in norms in different schools and in different subjects. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time reflecting on 
how my specific project applies to like my education classes versus my gender studies classes versus my political science classes versus maybe my core classes and what kind of what you're working against and what's working for you in those spaces so that was a really impactful exercise for me personally um especially considering like um my potential hope to have a career in education it's it's good to think about those things um yeah I also I wish I could have included this more in my project. There are a few mentions of it and a lot of the further reading um, does mention it, but I think it's one of the most important outcomes is not universalizing a female experience. Um, that goes just beyond this project, but um, whenever we see a tendency to do that, it does become a wealthy white female experience um, and you can expand other adjectives onto that. But yeah, the it's important to recognize the things that I do point out as common patterns. Um, also are compounded in unique ways by other identities and experiences that individuals carry in academic spaces. So yeah, when looking at these like kind of outcomes for professors or action steps, you would call them, um, understanding that's not gonna be the exact same for every student, but having an openness to that conversation with your students is the foundation of, of equity in the classroom. Yeah, that was a really amazing answer. Thank you so much. Um, so we can still take a couple more questions. If anyone wants to unmute, you can drop it in the chat. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So feminist studies form an important part of poli-sci and international relations. Have you experienced learning about feminism in the classroom? And if so, in your experience, has that impacted student and professor behavior regarding the feminine aspects you were highlighting in your resource? Sorry, I'm reading over the last part of that again. Um, so I have learned about feminism in the classroom a great deal in my gender studies classes because a lot of them have feminism in the title. Um, but I do feel it's something that's lacking in other classrooms mm -hmm. and that could be my own personal perspective because I just tend to approach things from a like gendered lens. Um, but I, I feel it contributes to every field, even like even STEM fields. Um, we talk about the resources you're bringing into the classroom and like what's considered the canon of each field. Um, and that really has a lot to do with the like limitations um, around gender. So I, I, yeah, I think that could always be expanded, um, especially in my poli sci classes. I'm I'm a very critical person, but I, I have been somewhat disappointed in the lack of like identity focused conversations around some political issues. Um, so I think that's always there's always room for expansion there. Um, and then I think we have one last question. Gabriel, do you find assumed norms of communication are also held such reinforced by peers such that this also impacts how students feel that they can express themselves in class or mostly an issue with faculty? That's a great question. I also, I do talk about my resource about um, how it's like student enforced as well. Um, I think especially a schools like AU where there's a very like kind of not competitive, but like kind of kind of tense nature of everyone's always doing something interesting, which is great. We have a talented student body, but um, it can create that kind of like peer enforced academic standard. Um, but yeah, I think it, it we if you can think about like your speech classes or your professional communication or whatever, um, even back to like high school, everything that's considered like good public speaking or like formal, like good academic writing um, and professional communication is really like the masculine standard. And you can read more about what the masculine standard means in terms of like lack of emotion and lack of personal references and interrupting all that stuff. But um, I also, yeah, I, I do feel it's peer, peer enforced to a certain degree. Again, it depends on what kind of class you're in and what kind of com like student community you're in. But I also want to highlight like beyond just the classroom in the literal sense, um, all the other like academic things. I find um, some of the like traditional feminine speech that I point out is really the easiest to highlight in email communication with professors. Like I can look back at my own emails and be like, oh wow, like this is very feminine speech. And, and there is like a tendency there to try to alter that um, because of how it does come off due to those conceptions. But yeah, I think it, it comes from a lot of different angles. That's not just it, the professor explicitly saying, you know, these are our norms. It, it's a lot more 
um, under the surface than that, which is kind of why I was drawn to the project is how often it goes unnamed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing. Um, we have our last student presentation. You want to introduce? Hi everyone, I'm Katsia and I'm a senior. I'm also graduating in like 10 days, so very excited. Um, and my project um, centers on supporting students during Ramadan. I'm speaking from experience as someone who's gone to this university for four years now, but also as someone who has led the Muslim Student Association for the past two Ramadans. So not, not the past Ramadan, but the two Ramadans before that. Um, and it was the first time that Ramadan fell during the academic calendar um, my freshman year. And so we started to have these conversations around what Ramadan would look like at American University um, during my freshman year, but it was during on uh, COVID. So um, a lot of it didn't necessarily translate into in-person um, in the same way. But when I came here, um, I, I feel like that's um, like, I've struggled to really understand why universities like American University that pride itself, itself on being so diverse, being so equitable, like why we don't have the resources to begin with, why students have to work to create those resources. Um, and also to preface this by saying that we don't like, we don't have paid staff support. It's very student led in terms of like advocating for what these resources would look like. I mean, we have some really great faculty advisors, but we don't have um, paid staff support by the university focused on these things. Um, so I'm speaking from that experience of having to battle that for the past for the past two years, but also this this year. Um, this year Ramadan looked very different. And that's why I have it in bolded, don't depoliticize Ramadan. I don't think that um like speaking from my experience as a Muslim student and also from my community experience, I think that when we try to depoliticize Ramadan and take away what it means to be a Muslim student, um and what it means to have a racialized identity on this campus and in this nation, um, we're not doing our students any favor. And I feel like that's something that I really struggled with this year when I tried to create this Ramadan resource that I was really looking forward to. Um, and I was met with a lot of hesitancy and also just complete censorship from every department I went to. Um, I was told I couldn't include anything about Islamophobia um, anything, any contextualization of what's happening around me in my Ramadan resource. And even after I had taken out those things and censored myself, I was still, um, I was still not allowed to publish a resource or, I mean, I was allowed, I wasn't allowed to communicate that resource as broadly as I'd like to have, to have it communicated. Um, and I mean, there was, a, there was an email sent by the university on Ramadan. I mean, there. We, we did some programming, but I feel like it doesn't really center student experiences when we can't have a Muslim student also talk about Ramadan. And I feel like that's part of the depoliticization and also making Ramadan and the Muslim identity um, palatable to this university and administration. And that's something I, um, I'm i in complete disagreement with and I think doesn't serve the community. Um, so I, I mean, my resource outlines after after a series of censorships, um, my resource aims to outline some of the things that students might still face. I think this year, um, I had centered this Ramadan resource on the idea that um, don't assume Muslim identity or Muslim experience in your classroom. Um, Muslim students might not be comfortable sharing that they are a Muslim in this time. I mean, I if you just read the news um so I just I think that 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 was my resource I mean um it was just saying don't assume Muslim identity create a classroom environment that still centers Muslim experiences during Ramadan but also create like a culture where even if a student is not telling you directly that they're observing Ramadan um you're still able to provide these resources and accommodations um for them and I also don't like the term accommodations I think that it should be that's something else that's something else that I struggled with a lot during this process of trying to figure out what language I wanted to use for uh, really centering student experiences and like accommodations just didn't feel like the right language I think it should have been more um, a cultivation of classroom climate um, 
really rethinking what our classroom should look like. Um, Ramadan is a time that you step back from kind of so many things <laughs> um, and really hone in on your spiritual well-being. Um, but it's it's a unique in the way that students are fasting. Um, students are not able to drink water, eat food. They're 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 not in the f mental headspace either often to be able to think about classes and think about their assignments in the same way. So really thinking about the psych psychology of that and then the physical impacts of that on a student's body um, as they're fasting for um, 30 or so days. And then also um, not assuming that everyone observes Ramadan in the same way. Some students don't fast and they're still praying. They're still like, there. there's a lot of complexity in that experience. So um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. I think that uh, American University and higher education at large has a lot to deal with. And I think it does start with having supportive faculty, um, supportive administration, um, and also not relying on students to do this work. And so like, while I'm happy to do it, I think long-term this is not feasible or sustainable. Um, and this is only like, I tried to look at Ramadan resources anywhere. There's nothing that has American University and Ramadan resource in the same like, I don't know, category when you look it up. Uh, there's very few resources from other universities as well. So like, I guess my question is really like, what are we lacking? Um, and then as we move forward where Ramadan does fall into, like Ramadan will continue to fall into the academic calendar for many years to come. And so um, what does that look like? And how do we support your students through that? Thank you so much. Um, we're now gonna move to the Q and A portion for Katsia. So any questions, um, please drop them in the chat or on mute. Do you have a comment from Chad, it's a compliment. This is a great intersectional observation that depoliticizing Muslim identity is linked with or parallel to ableist mechanisms like accommodations. Thank you, Shed, for that. It's a really great comment. <laughs> um, and I'm open to any and all questions. Yeah, I think this is something I I tried to work around for, I mean, a whole year now, and I still haven't found the right language. Um, I think the best I can like think of is like radically rethinking education in all the ways. Um, like, Ramadan is an intersectional experience, um, but I, I do hope that we're able to come up with better language around this, but also it does reflect the the lack of like appropriate language to begin with in, in this field. Definitely. So any questions? She's great at answering them, just like our other partners. Um, I think I have a question. Go for it. You spoke a little bit about, you know, your process um, writing this. I was there to witness it too. Um, what would you say if you had to like add to this project or maybe any advice you'd give to student partners in the future or other student activists who may want to continue doing this work? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think it's really important that we are not decontextualizing anything that we do. Um, and it, this, it does go more broadly as well. I think we have some real problems and we need to be more willing to address them. Um, but I'm not in favor of DEI efforts around Ramadan if they don't address the very root causes of Islamophobia on this, on this campus, um, along with all the other forms of bigotry that exist. And I, I just think that we can't do this work if we're not willing to have difficult conversations around it. Um, last year or last semester, my resource focused on academic violence and what like how that's like invisible in often ways, um, but very real. Um, so I, I think that also ties in. Yeah, I see we have a question in the chat, but we can save it for our larger Q&A portion, which we're gonna move to now. Can I? <laughs> 
So this is an open Q&A. So any questions you would like to ask any of our partners are welcome. Um, since I'm sitting right next to Katia, I think we can move uh, to this question that was just put in the chat. Um, so practical concrete steps that professors can take, would you recommend trying to avoid major assignments due to the holiday? And based on the way the holiday sometimes falls within the academic calendar, is this possible? I, I would say it is possible. I think you also need to be, like I think as a university, we need to be able to empower our students to also ask for the uh, for this kind of flexibility and also empower our professors to provide this kind of flexibility. Um, I, I think that assignments can be, like ideally, um, if professors are able to communicate in advance, like for example, um, and not make significant changes to their syllabus, students can prep ahead and if professors are able to provide that kind of support in advance to Ramadan, um, for context, Ramadan moves back the academic calendar every year. Um, so two years ago, it fell right during finals week. This year, um, if we still, like, we weren't in the major, most, like, um, I guess most stressful part of the semester when Ramadan fell, so it was a little bit nicer, but it, it does move around and move back every semester. And so planning around that um, for every spring semester for the time being, and then moving forward for fall semesters, like years down the line. Um, I think just communicating that in advance would be, is is the most helpful thing that a professor can do in this time. Yes, thank you for that answer. And we have a question that was asked earlier that was directed at CL, but any one of our student partners can answer. Um, it says, I hear student from students a lot actually that students feel alone on campus. What are creative ways that the university or even departments can foster community? Any takers? CL, do you want to go for it? <laughs> yeah, see, this is a really complicated question just because, and I will say like in my interviews, the feeling of isolation was just really, really common and seemed to be one of the most detrimental things. Um, and I guess, well, my project specifically focused on what like professors can do. Um, so I can offer some insight into that. Um, I'd say like in targeting isolation specifically, I think um, like forming relationships with students, I think came out as like the most effective way to con kind of combat those feelings um, of being isolated on campus. Um, and just, you know, making it clear that students can come to you if they're struggling with these things. Um, and I guess like that can apply to anybody, like just when you're interacting with students, you know, make yourself approachable. Um, don't use a lot of, you know, really complicated jargon or things when you're explaining things when you're first meeting somebody, if you don't know anything about their background. Um, it's once again, like assuming a lot of background knowledge, um, which is something that can be really hard, especially for first gen students. Um, but yeah, I think, just, yeah, forming those relationships, being approachable, making yourself available, those things can definitely um, help students feel less alone. Thank you, Sale, for that well thought out answer. There was a question earlier in the chat for Marie. Um, so it says, your resource very interestingly delves into the question of identity as a student and how that informs navigating college. Have you had any interactions with faculty that touched on or leaned into these issues? Did you view them as positive or negative or both? Yeah, okay, sorry. I had a, that question had to sink in a little bit. It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, I had a lot of interactions with faculty actually that kind of centered around my identity and like helped me lean into my identity when I was going into an academic an academic setting and trying to like navigate my way as a student and I found that faculty that knew how to talk about identity with students were always very good at helping students navigate through it and the staff, faculty that didn't know how to talk about identity with students they never did like it only ever would come up if if the if my professor or my mentor understood or like understood empathized or like understood knew how to talk about that kind of that kind of topic with a student and only then was it really successful but in the moments that they were very successful they are some of my favorite professors i've ever had here at au so 
Thank you, Mary. Um, so we have another question in the chat. Uh, this is directed at all the student partners. Have you made meaning of being a part of this group? How has this experience enriched your time at AU? Anyone? <laughs> I can answer this <laughs> right here. Um, I love this group of people. I've made some great friends with this group of people. I'm my Ruba, my Kadia, Ciel, Gabriela. Um, and it's been great to, one, first of all, have a lot of community. And second of all, to use kind of the skills that I've learned as a literature student for something that's kind of like a job. I don't want to, I refrain from saying job because I don't want to make everything sound like it's for a professional career or anything like that. But I don't know, as a literature student with a concentration in creative writing, sometimes you're thinking, oh, when am I going to use this in a professional career? And it was like kind of, it was very nice that we had a space to use the skills that we learned at AU and actively in like in the classroom and actively use it in um in our in a job and it was very nice that we got to choose our own projects and stuff like that so I got fulfillment socially I got fulfillment academically and then I got fulfillment professionally it's a great program yeah um I can also answer because I feel like I haven't talked to them no I'm kidding <laughs> um but I think for me love how you move. I, I think for me this program has definitely like been a big part of my career here at college. And one of the biggest things, I was actually talking to an AI, AU alum recently, and they spoke about how, what they miss about college is being able to learn from their peers as well as their professors. And I think that is something that is so um, real and explicit in this group is I've been able to learn from past partners. And in that, I've also been able to reinforce my belief of my own voice and the importance of it. Um, I've learned how to advocate for not only myself in the classroom, but for my friends and fellow students here as well, and also get some insight into uh, professors' experiences. And that's been um, really a great opportunity for me. I tried to do consulting with professors this semester. And even though I didn't get much traction with that program, I thought it was just really um, for lack of a better word, healing uh, for both students and professors to, you know, be able to see one another and recognize that a lot of the times uh, the system that we're in isn't the most nurturing, isn't the most accommodating or accessible. Um, so in that, I think we were able to validate one another as student and professors. So it's been a really, really great opportunity for, I think, all of us to do that. I think we have time for maybe one more person to share on this question if they'd like to. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of things I gained from this program, it definitely was awesome to kind of feel like students are being given a voice on campus. Um, and like, you know, like, I think kind of everyone focused on experiences they've been through here that have been somewhat detrimental. And so I think it was definitely cool to feel like, you know, those experiences I guess like weren't for nothing you know like we can turn negative things that we've experienced into resources that hopefully will make it so that students in the future are less likely to go through those same things um and then also I guess like in relation to um Gabriella's project actually like because I'm an SIS so much of what I'm doing is very like kind of using that um masculine kind of language whether like that's in research or policy papers or things like that and it definitely was very cool to be able to do something more creative like a podcast and be more expressive and bring in people's experience um people's experiences in my own like with anecdotes and things like that because that's something that um I really don't get to do a lot in in my major so that was cool Um, so once again, thank you to all of our student partners for sharing. You'll see in the chat uh, that Lindsay put a survey that you can fill out on how your experience at this event. And, you know, before we leave, we ask you to reflect on ways that you can apply student perspective into your teaching. And just again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we really all appreciate it. Everyone worked really hard this semester. And uh, this is a perfect way to end it off. So thank you. And Hannah Thank also. You. <laughs> Hannah. Me. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just want to say that wow, I'm incredibly proud of all of you. And this was 
amazing. And thank you all for being here. Um, I really encourage you to continue reading, sharing, um, listening to, looking at their resources. I know we're working really hard. Reba's been working really hard, especially on just getting the word out about the Student Partners Program as it's growing. So we appreciate everyone for being here and please share these resources with your colleagues. Um, we'll be in touch in the fall too with more, more events, more things to look forward to. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I'm blurry too. I'm oh, blurry so we can say, you know, good luck students and faculty with finals, grading, everything that's going on right now. It's in a busy time. We'll stick around if anybody has any last questions or comments.